On game night, there's only one food delivery service that's a real slam dunk. Grubhub's got you covered with game time eats, late night treats, lazy lunches, family dinners, and more. It's all on Grubhub. And now Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free. So you pay zero delivery fees when you order. Visit goforgrubhub.com slash Amazon for details. And with the holidays right around the corner, Grubhub gift cards are the perfect gift for everyone on your list. Download the Grubhub app today. Go for Grubhub. This holiday, Audible invites you to listen in on some of today's most creative musicians telling their stories in their own words. Origins is an Audible Originals podcast series featuring music and memories from artists like Billie Eilish, Camilo, Doja Cat, Flying Lotus, and more. Discover what shaped their creativity and get drawn into the immersive sound design that lets you feel the experiences that inspired them. Start listening to this innovative new series at audible.com slash origins. AT&T believes that if you want a smartphone, you should get the best deal on that smartphone, no matter what kind of smartphone person you are. People who reply to texts immediately. Emoji over texters, emoji haters, custom emoji makers, app personalizers, and alphabetizers. Even those who blast music off their phone at the gym. At AT&T, we give new and existing customers our best deals on every smartphone. Save up to $1,000 on our most popular smartphones with eligible trade-in. Offers vary by device. Terms and restrictions apply. See at and or visit an AT&T store for details. This is the Jabberjaw Podcast Network. Hello, everybody. How are you doing this fine afternoon or evening or morning whenever you're listening to this? Hopefully, it's morning because this episode, I am throwing fire. Absolute fire. This is a white whale episode. I am so excited to tell you that John K. Sampson from The Weaker Thans is on this very episode. He's one of my favorite musicians probably of all time. The Weaker Thans are top 10 favorite band. I just can't tell you how much this pleases me that I got to speak to him because like, you know, I, you try not to like put these people on pedestals because they're just like, they're normal human beings, especially when you're talking about in the context of independent music. Right. But there are certain people where you're just like, wow, like they're a real human. Like, and that's what John K. Sampson just like showed me during this conversation, but more on him in a moment. Let me talk to you about the other things that I'm excited about. One is a new sponsor, which I am so excited about. You've heard me talk about them before, most specifically on last week's episode with Matt Pryor and Radar State, the label, Wiretap Records. I love them so much. Rob is a friend of mine and he does a great job. But what I want to tell you about is he does something super, super cool called the Wiretap Record Club. Now, let me play you just a little quick sizzle reel. You know, that's what we in the industry call like, you know, like get you excited. So I'm going to play that right now. These are basically all of his recent releases and you can kind of get a little sampling. Okay, so that is what he is putting out and his record club. Basically, uh, let me let me let me break this down for you. It's 125 bucks. There is limited to 50 total and you'll get every release they press on vinyl in 2019. So it's a minimum of 10 LPs, guaranteed test press from this year's catalog, an exclusive t-shirt, an enamel pin, all digital downloads, member discounts and more. So you can go to wiretaprecords.com and check out what they have to offer. That's super cheap for 10 LPs. And a t-shirt and a pin like basically it is your vote for independent music to be like you know what i support what you do and i trust what the label has going on he sent me a bunch of their releases and frankly there's no dud in there so wiretap records check out their uh yeah the record club it's amazing but there's a 15 dollar discount to listeners of this show use the code 100 words upon checkout and you will get $15 off. Okay. So basically it's $110 for a boatload of music. Okay. Thank you very much wiretap and uh, check out their stuff. 
I also have to tell you about rockabilia.com. PC Jabberjaw is the code that will give you 10% off all the band merch that you can possibly buy from their website. I love what they do. They offer amazing high quality stuff that is all licensed officially from the band. So you're not going to be supporting bootleggers and or, or just get terrible shirts, you know, because like you've gotten those ones before where you're like, oh, wow, this is great. And it's like some iron on transfer and then like one wash. It's done. No, that does not happen. I've ordered multiple shirts from them and they are a spectacular company. So PC Jabberjaw will get you 10% off. Thank you, Rockabilia, for your continued support of this show. Before I talk about John K. Sampson, holy moly, I have been so stressed. Like I have never felt stress from my work really, frankly, ever. I've just been fortunate enough. Where, I mean, like you feel stressful moments and stressful times when you're like leading up to, you know, I was working at the record label. I remember an incredibly stressful time when, you know, like bands from Germany were coming over to tour and I was making sure that all of the, you know, van rentals and details were all settled and stuff. And th- there were some stressful times there. And maybe I just, you know, you have a good, uh, we as humans have a, a good way of forgetting those stressful moments. But like I'm sitting in a stressful moment right now and uh, man, it sucks. It really does suck. Like, you know, heart palpitations. Like I haven't gone to full blown panic attacks, which is good because I've had, you know, friends around me and other people to kind of balance me out. But um, yeah, I just want you to know that if you're feeling that stress for whatever it is that you're going through, I'm there right there with you and just put your head down. You will be able to get through it. I, I assure you, you've been through more difficult things in the past. I know I have. It's like my wife survived cancer. And I was right there with her as she was getting chemotherapy and all these horrible, horrible things. And I was able to walk along with her on that. And that was brutal to watch. So what's some work stress, right? Okay. But I just want you to know that you are not alone. I'm, I'm feeling you. So hundred words podcast at gmail.com. If you want to reach out and, and you know, commiserate, be like, yeah, I'm going through a stressful time too. But, um, let's talk about John K. Sampson. Like I said, this, this guy looms so large in my life because I mean, I love propaganda love the weaker thans. And I just think what he has done, he has, he, he's been able to carve out his own life with being a creative person with creating incredible music, incredible lyrics. I just, I could go on for hours and hours, how much I respect the art that he puts out there and how much I love him. And I, I honestly, I chased this interview for about, I want to say going on two years. And I have to give a very, very large thank you to Chris Hanna from Propaganda, who is a previous guest on this show, who uh, connected me with with John. And uh, I just I'm I'm thankful for that. So here is my discussion with John K. Sampson. Holy crap. I can't believe I'm saying that. Propagandi was a huge band for me. I'm, I'm 38 years old, uh-huh. so you know you guys put out those records uh-huh. right in the prime time of me getting into you know a lot of punk and hardcore right, and stuff right. like that. Um, but then right. I I also loved uh, you know when you put out the Weaker Than's record on you know G7 and Fallow and started to play uh-huh. shows around that. Like I saw you uh, play at Coos Cafe in Santa Ana here in gosh I don't know it was like 90. Seven ninety eight, maybe something like that. Yeah, uh, I remember that show. That was really fun. I enjoyed that. Yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah. And it, it, but it it was funny because I that was kind of the first time I really recognized uh, the idea of someone expecting something out of an artist mm. and them not yeah. delivering the thing that they expected. You know, so it's like right. clearly people are like, oh yeah, John from Propaganda. So here's his uh, you know quiet yeah. side project or whatever. <laughs> But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So I, I presume that when you first started to kind of do that and people were, you know, clearly attaching you to your previous work, um, was that, right. kind of, was that kind of a, a weird vibe where it was like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm not going to play shredding punk anymore. Like this is what I got. Right, right. <laughs> I suppose so. Um, I think, yeah, it was, it was definitely a, a case of, um, of kind of, uh, not, meeting a certain segment of the people who showed up's um, expectations. Uh, But there was also something beautiful about that that I enjoyed. Um, And this was before kind of music was uh, as 
as kind of saturated in the culture as it is now. So, um, so you would kind of come to see a band, as as you'll recall, um, to hear the band, not to hear them play the songs that you already knew, right? So there was something kind of exciting about that as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and I can never, uh, I can never overstate how how uh, grateful I am uh, to to have been in propaganda and have had that kind of launching pad for for um, for the rest of my life as a as a as a writer. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, I, I think it's. Uh, it's funny because, you know, most, even at this time, you know, whatever, we're, you know, 25 years removed from that, but people will, right. you know, always link you to that, even though, you know, you've clear, you've clearly carved, oh, yeah. out, carved out your own niche, but I think it's... No, absolutely. And I think like the fact is that those records will have sold more than all of my other work combined in the end. <laughs> so and that's an interesting, an interesting kind of fact to me and, and something that I... I think about and respect and is that, you know, some people will come expecting something else. And, uh, and yeah, sometimes that was difficult. Like, like there were certainly, there were certainly times when, um, when it flared in kind of unpleasant ways, uh, where, you know, like, I don't know, like people would throw, throw things at me or, or kind of like, you know, there there were, there were some, there were some terrible moments, but you know, for the most part, the punk scene was pretty open to what I was doing and, um, pretty generous with, with their kind of, uh, with their, um, acceptance and kind of engagement with, with my work after, after being in propaganda. Yeah. 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 And I, I think too, because it, it wasn't like you as a person all of a sudden started to like, you know, wear cowboy boots and like put on a costume and like right. not talk about politics. Like you just were you sure. except in a different vehicle, you know? <laughs> well, and for me it was always like, there's a pretty obvious through line in the, in the few songs that I, I sang, uh, lead with, uh, with propaganda. Those, those songs are kind of still the, the kind of model. I mean, they, those, the first week of Ends record was not, not very far from, from, uh, from my previous work. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't see it as, as, uh, such a, such a leap really. Right. But you never do right from the center, <laughs> from, <laughs> from the, from the center of it, you can't really see the, see the margins i guess yeah yeah for sure and uh, in just having this little discussion it just reminded me too i i remember seeing kind of you know on the flip side where you uh, you know i saw you play at the troubadour and i think if i'm not mistaken you uh dashboard confessional was opening up for you and this is like oh, yeah, that's right. right and I, I just remember that yeah was, that's right right i it, forgot about that trip yeah yeah and it was it was so so interesting because you had these two completely separate crowds you had your you know people yeah. who were completely tapped into the mainstream coming to watch Chris Caraba play and then people, yeah. you know, sort of curiously sticking around where it's like, Hey, who's this dude headlining? And then kind of being like, Oh, yeah. interesting. I just, yeah, I remember that experience too. <laughs> that was really, yeah, that was, that was strange. And that was not, uh, not the, that was fun, kind of fun too. Like it was like trying to hold the attention of those people who were just there to see Chris was, was, uh, was an interesting challenge for sure. Um, I, I ended up in that position a few times. Arcade Fire opened for the Weaker Thans once. Um, just as the show was booked before their first record kind of became massive, and then we had already booked the show. I think it was it was in the Pacific Northwest somewhere, and and so that was like I was like, oh my god, like <laughs> the, the, the you know Arcade Fire is opening for us for some reason, so. And, and and there was no way to hold that. I mean, it, yeah, it was interesting. Anyway, it's, like, right. it's always like the industry. Yeah, the way the industry moves is is so. Um, uh, it's yeah, you can't really you can't really um, plan it. <laughs> 
No, no. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like the, yeah, the, yeah. Be, the best la- best laid plans. All of a sudden, are just like, oh, oh, wow. Sure, sure. I gotta, I gotta follow this now. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I like that feeling too. Like, uh, I also like, uh, you know, the the whole. Um, I always loved playing uh, during propaganda days uh, at Gilman Street in uh, in the East Bay there. Um, because they they had uh, they had this uh, payment system where it was weighted towards whoever drove the farthest, right? So it was like if you were from if you were like the biggest band on the bill, but you were from you know like Portland, and another band was from um, New York, you know that played first, the New York band would get more money. And I always thought that that. If if I had my way, that's that's how the world would work. It was kind of beautiful. Yeah, exactly. It's very uh, egalitarian, where it's like, yeah, you just drove yeah. the farthest. So yeah, yeah. Practically speaking. Yeah. <laughs> practically speaking. Yeah. Um, so you know, kind of kind of shifting the focus towards uh, you as a mm. person. Um, you, there, you know, you are. Yeah you know, a private person in the sense of, you know, you're not, uh, you know, publishing stuff on social media and talking about your narrative and doing all the things that people do on social media. But, um, were you actually mm-hmm. born and raised in Winnipeg? I was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Tried and true. So, uh, I've been here all my 45 years and yeah. And I was. what was your, uh, what was your family structure like as you were growing up? Like mom and dad in the house, do you have brothers and sisters? Yeah. Uh, uh, my parents were in the house and my sister, and um yeah i grew up uh i grew up in a in a in an excellent home and i um yeah i was in uh i was in children's choirs which was sort of my first um my first exposure to music i guess and i was uh raised in the in a kind of high lutheran church mm-hmm. um that had a sung liturgy so it was kind of this this kind of form of talk singing uh, that I, I, I feel like was pretty, uh, I can kind of trace back to my, my, uh, my talk singing now <laughs> is, is that, kind right. of, that kind of early, um, exposure to music. So yeah. And, and so, and then, yeah, children's choirs was my kind of, um, uh, kind of first exposure to music and, um, and uh yeah got it and so what, what was your um yeah i guess what was the uh, the trade that your family was in like you know what did your mom and dad do for work as you were growing up in the house uh my dad's a lawyer and my mom's a teacher oh okay very tried and true um you know <laughs> very quintessential yeah. jobs yes yes that's true that's what did true. you what did your mom teach uh she taught uh elementary school oh nice did you have her as a teacher I did not know. Okay, <laughs> it's funny because I, I, I definitely think I, I come from a, a family of teachers as well, and I think it's there's oh, there's always that notion of like, no, I would never want my mom as a teacher. Like I, you know, but then some other right, right. some other kids are like, oh, that'd be cool if like my mom or dad was like you know working at the school or whatever, and then it's like I don't know yeah, about yeah. that. Did you ever uh, encounter that? Did I, you have? Your- I, did, I did not have my, my mom. She actually sent, you know, she taught at public school and she sent me to private school because she was like. Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted small class sizes for you. And so I was like, okay, fair oh, enough. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, yeah. yeah fair enough. Sure. Uh, and then yeah. what, what, and you, you, what sort of, uh, I guess, law did your dad practice? Um, you know, I'm not sure. Okay, fair uh, enough. I'm not, I'm not totally sure, actually. He was. I think in contract, uh, contract law, I believe. Sure, yeah. sure. So, like, did he yeah. did he have his own practice, or was he like working within the context of a company that he was their uh, their go to guy? Yeah, he was a he, he was a partner in a in a law firm here in Winnipeg. Nice, nice. And are yeah. are are, are, you, are you the uh, older sibling or the younger sibling? I am the older. Yes. So you're the trail yeah. you're the trailblazer. I suppose it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I mean, I think most people that kind of think of Winnipeg, um, you know, view it as this, uh, you know, uh, weather stripped city that, you know, obviously, mm-hmm. obviously has some culture, but you know, in many, sure. res- many respects, it's been a town that, uh, often gets uh, overlooked when you're talking about Canada. Cause most people like 
in America, yeah, reference yeah. just the coast. Sure. Um, but you know, what was your experience as you were, you know, growing up in Winnipeg? Oh. To, was it just like, okay, yeah. I got to play hockey and that's pretty much it. Or what did you right, feel? Right. I was a curling kid myself. So okay. I, I curled from an early age and I still curl. Um, so that's, that's kind of the other, I think kind of more has the more, uh, has more purchase as in my mind as like the national sport in that, oh, everyone can play it in a way like it's it's sort of i like the kind of democratic aspects of it i was certainly a hockey kid as well growing up but i never really played um and i was yeah obsessed by the nhl um but but kind of uh that kind of um dissipated sort of in my in my teens for sure and uh yeah winnipeg is like it's a it's it's a it's a geographically quite marginalized place like it's it's quite far from any other city so i think over the years it's had to kind of invent its own culture in a way and the weather has a lot to do with that culture as well so i feel like um people here sort of have to we have to entertain each other and ourselves and and so i feel like there's a real kind of tradition of of bands especially um basically as something to do when you uh, can't spend a lot of time outside yeah Yeah. and honestly i don't know i don't know why i always kind of drew the parallels between um you know winnipeg and something like you know iceland i mean obviously iceland is even more you know removed geographically but it, it definitely resides in that same sort of, uh, you know, uh, pro- oh, pride, yeah. Yeah, pride about I, the city and yeah. Yeah. Cause my father's family is Icelandic and, 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 uh, and Winnipeg and Manitoba is the biggest population of Icelanders outside of Iceland. Weirdly enough, they started immigrating in, uh, you know, late 1800s. And my grandfather was, um, was printed the local one of one of the two local uh, Icelandic newspapers here weirdly enough but I found yeah I find that there's a really interesting yeah you're right I think the Icelandic culture is similar in that sense that it's it's uh, it had to invent itself in a way and and I still feel like yeah Winnipeg is is like that in a lot of ways just because um even you know, with the internet and with with the the more kind of uh, with the spread of culture being kind of more democratic and available, you know, the physical isolation is still there. Like it still exists, right? It's it's right. just a fact. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so so it's a it was an interesting place to to kind of it is an interesting place I think to come from, and it's a place that you know I think I discovered fairly early on was what I wanted to write about and what I wanted to try and understand is is this place because it has it sort of has everything that I'm looking for as a writer. Um, uh, it you know. It bothers me. Uh, it delights me. It's you know, it's got um, it's it's got kind of a um, it's a it's a small town. You know, it's a it's a it's also a city. It's it's um, it's unjust and and uh, and strange. Yeah. And so yeah, it's it's. I feel like it's something I'm still trying to get right, and and something that I'm I'm grateful for. Yeah. Well, I, I think I, I, I always personally, and I know a lot of other people identified with that notion as well, just because, mm. you know, most people like, you know, whatever, I'm, my experience of living in Southern California and living, you know, in Orange County, which is, you know, white, suburban, sure. very, you know, well off, <laughs> hearing other people's experiences, you know, broadened my horizon in general, and then understood that it's like, mm. oh, like, you, you know, not only, you know, is a band like, you know, Prop Gandhi and Weaker Than speaking about, you know winnipeg and politics and everything else it's just like oh this is something i didn't even consider and it you know i need a person to deliver it to me in song in order to like put it in context where it's like oh yes this is something i should care about yeah yeah 
Let me solve all of your holiday shopping problems right now by talking to you about the premium audio products from Raycon. They have wireless earbuds, headphones, and speakers that offer premium sound. I personally adore the wireless earbuds. I've been using them for four or five years. They got a ton of battery life. We're talking 54 plus hours. It's incredible. And honestly, I have gotten them for gifts for my significant other. I've gotten them for my family and friends. And they all come back to me and they're like, dude, this is incredible. Why have I never used these before? And I'm like, I don't know. That's your fault. That's why I am here to help you. And for the next month, Raycon will have a countdown to Christmas with a new pop-up flash deal for you to take advantage of every single day. Now, what can you do? You can go to buyraycon.com slash Ray and get the best deals around. That gets you 15% off site-wide with code HOLIDAY plus free shipping. That is code HOLIDAY at buyraycon.com slash Ray for 15% off your Raycon purchase and then free shipping. So again, go to buyraycon.com slash Ray, solve all of your shopping problems, and then maybe, you know, toss a pair of headphones here for you, okay? Maybe just an idea, but... Thank you, Raycon, and buy them now. Explore new cultures and experiences with Intrepid Travel. Intrepid specializes in socially conscious travel with over 900 amazing small group adventures to choose from in more than 100 countries. Whether it's the mountaintop vistas of the Andes, the wildlife of Tanzania, or the hidden noodle bars of Vietnam, Intrepid is there. There to get you off the beaten track, behind the scenes, and totally immersed in the joy of travel. Discover more at IntrepidTravel.com. Intrepid Travel. Travel is back for good. What's the worst thing about sports? (laughs) That's right. All those breaks in play. But you can make them all better by using Grubhub. You wouldn't have a movie night without snacks, so why would you settle for a halftime without food? Grubhub has every food you could possibly crave, from national favorites to local spots. Reorder your regulars or find something brand lip-smackingly new. You can search by city, cuisine, restaurant name, or if it's a firm favorite, even by menu item. Delivered on time at the lowest price. Order through the Grubhub app or online at grubhub.com. That's grubhub.com. And of course, don't forget forget, with the holidays right around the corner, Grubhub gift cards are the perfect gift for everyone on your list. Now Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free. That's zero dollar food delivery fees from your favorite restaurants. Visit goforgrubhub.com slash Amazon for terms and details. Go for Grubhub. Oh, well, that's lovely. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's kind of what my favorite... Um, you know, music does, I guess, and and art in general. Yeah, for sure. And it's it's certainly what when I first heard Propaganda, I was like, I had that reaction where I was like, kind of, uh, kind of broke my mind a little bit, recognizing that someone was writing about the place that I'm from. Right. And yeah, that was that was uh, that's kind of. Uh, yeah. I what you're chasing. Like important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, y- y- the, the idea, I mean, this is me uh, sort of projecting upon you just in the times that I've watched mm-hmm. you play and, you know, what I kind of know about you as a quote-unquote public figure, but um, mm-hmm. you are, you know, you're, you're a pretty reserved dude. You're definitely not the sort of guy that, you know, I would probably define as, uh, you know, the life of the party, kicking the doors open and being nope. like, everybody pay attention to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. Yeah. Was that, was that kind of always who you were as far as like, you know, the quiet natured and, uh, you know, a more, uh, I guess, introspective, thoughtful person? Um, or was that something yeah. that you kind of, um, I don't know, not, not tried on, but was that something that has sure. always been kind of consistent? Yeah. I mean, uh, Definitely, that's just part of who I am. I'm I'm pretty private, and and uh, and I certainly wouldn't. I know that I wouldn't be a songwriter if I was starting today, just because the the um, kind of dire publicness of it for me would just be there would be no way I would I would I would I would run from that. Right. Um, I would run. I would run from the contemporary. Um, music industry, even in its, I think in its wonderful independent forms, it just wouldn't be for me. Um, yeah, and I mean, part of it is also, 
uh, you know, mental illness, which is, is something that I've, I've, uh, I struggle with, uh, like a lot of people do. Mm-hmm. So um, it's certainly not good, good for that for me. Um, the the publicness of of um, that kind of lens is uh, is I've discovered. So I kind of always knew is is not not conducive to me being healthy. Right. So that's you know that's something that I struggle with, and I think a lot of a lot of musicians and artists struggle with now. Um, so yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a curious um, place for me to be in a way, and and the punk scene um, was great for me because it 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 accepted that in a way. It was really, um, uh, at the time, I'm, I don't know what it's like now, but it was, it was very, um, it was very democratic and, and it was, uh, welcoming to me at least. So yeah, it was kind of, I feel like there's still, um, you know, my, the, the track of my, of my career kind of veered off from that, ethos in some ways um and and that was probably probably a mistake in some ways that i'm trying to trying to circle back to the um the uh that generous democratic spirit Mm -hmm. in music um so lately i've been doing house concert tours right and and I love how much they remind me of basement shows that that um, that I that I would be a part of in the '90s, um, and just that that kind of element of it. So I'm a lot more comfortable in those settings. And and yeah, I mean, yeah, I never really became entirely comfortable with <laughs> with performance. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, though I guess you know, yeah, hard to say. Yeah, to say. yeah. Well, well, like, I, I, no, like no. in the beginning, I felt like in the beginning, I felt like I loved the travel and didn't like the shows. Shows kind of terrified me in that, but the travel was great, and I would go for walks in every city that Propaganda went to. I would go on these massive walks, and and I would love that. And now I'm sort of at the point where I actually love the shows and I don't really like the travel. Mm-hmm. So it's this kind of weird, weird, um, it's weird flip, weird kind of flip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I really like those, those thoughts that you're, um, you know, being able to, uh, articulate because I do think the, uh, yeah. you know, as people, just because, you know, uh, essentially punk and hardcore has existed for, for so long now to where, you know, it impact, it's impacted people that are, you know, 30 years younger than us and, you know, whatever, yeah. arguably 10 to 20 years older than us. So uh-huh. now you have people that are doing things that are, um, not really technically related to that DIY right. culture, yeah, yeah. but are still, yeah. like, like you said, you know, no one, I, I don't, you know, I would challenge anybody to obviously look at the, you know, what you have done musically career wise and everything and not be able to find the obvious through line of like, well, yeah, essentially mm-hmm. you're still just, you know, the DIY, like, you know, yeah. punk and hardcore kid, even though, right. you know, you wouldn't self describe as that, but right. the notion is, yeah, like, yeah. you know? Yeah, no, that's and that's still what I think of myself as. I know that it's it's pretty hard to see from as an uh, from an outsider. I'm I'm sure, and especially someone who didn't have the context of 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 um, being part of a punk scene. But but yeah, I do feel like its template is still uh, kind of on everything on everything that I do. Yeah, yeah. no, it's great. It's great. Um, Hmm. And as you, um, I, I guess, what was the kind of, um, you know, because clearly it's not like the idea of, uh, you know, you joining Propagandi and you guys, you know, playing out and touring and stuff like that. Like, you know, that wasn't the, the quote unquote business plan, as it were. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, you know, what what was the, I guess, the supposed path for you as you were going through school? Like, you know, did you like school? Like, what were you, you know, were, were you, I guess, kind of growing up to be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a lawyer like sure. my dad or whatever. What was the path? No, I hated school, and and I'm still bitter about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love that. I, uh, 
I feel like it's it's not a it's 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 not good. <laughs> so um, I hated school. Uh, it, it it was I found I found it profoundly unpleasant, and uh, and there was almost nothing good about it for me at least. Um, but I was more um, I read books, which 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 um, I feel like kind of was my one one saving uh, not one saving thing, but but it was it was kind of my my uh, my comfort was was books more than music actually so so um i did buy a base i i, I worked a, like a part-time job or during the summer when i was 15 i think uh painting boards and i uh bought a base um i played guitar sort of really badly before that and i recognized that i um that no band was going to have me really as a guitar player, so I thought a bass would would be um, would be uh, I would be able to play music with other people, and I was. So I I was in a band in in high school, and um, and so so that was uh, uh, it. It was it was um, it wasn't particularly punk. I don't think we were sort of more indie rock kids. Mm-hmm. Um, we were into the replacements and and um, and the pixies and and stuff like that. But I was obsessed with this writer named Kurt Vonnegut, um, and and he's this really wonderful novelist and writer, and and he's really political. Like he was a he's kind of a a wonderful leftist humanist writer. Um, and so I felt like when I heard Propaganda for the first time, I was I I heard those politics, and to me, I think before that, music had been strictly sort of an emotional outlet. And then when I heard Chris and Jord, I was like, this is this is uh, you know. Twinning those two things together right. uh, in in a profound way, in a way that I was just like, I was like, I, this is amazing. So, um, so, and then I just was in the right place at the right time. I saw a poster they put at the local skateboard shop, um, and I had, I think I'd met them before, um, and uh, and so. You know, I, I think about it now, and they were sort of the first punk band I heard. So it's kind of weird that that was sort of my right. Your intro and your in like your first intro real band, yeah, <laughs> happens to be this really incredible man. I thought, and and so yeah, it was it was. Uh, uh, I don't think anyone else tried out. I was like, you know, I was like, and I, I'm not. Uh, I was not then, and am not now a good bass player i cannot be called a good bass player <laughs> right um you're profi- I, you're proficient <laughs> i'm proficient enough i you know i i'm i'm learning i'm uh, uh my wife christine fellows is putting out a record this month and i'll be touring in her band and playing bass and i picked it up the other day and i was like oh wow i really i had no idea what i was doing because <laughs> i was like <laughs> you know um but i uh, but there was the part of the generosity and openness of of the music itself was that that was kind of cool like i i could i could fit into it i could play the root notes and and jump up and down and kind of get by in a way so yeah so that's really uh you know and and i guess i was also really uh impressed by uh how melodic Chris and Jord were like they are, you know, the way they sang together on those early tape cassette tapes that I heard. I was like, wow, singing like they're singing together in harmony, and uh, and that really kind of appealed to me in a big way. I was like, that's really exciting, and uh, so yeah, I was, uh, I, it was a total total fluke. So yeah, and I think that's kind of how. When I heard them, I was like, I want to write 
songs too. Um, I had written songs before, but I had never really uh, kind of aspired to too much before that. So, so yeah, they're they're still kind of like the biggest, probably. Yeah, they are the biggest influence on my writing. Christine, my wife, and and those guys. Yeah, no, for that's, sure. That's, you know, that's incredible. Well, yeah, because yeah. that that opportunity gave you the voice to be able to be like, oh yeah, like they they can do it. Like I can do some something yeah. similar and in, in, yeah, sa- yeah. in the same way that you know you're always going to view yourself as a punk and hardcore kid and it's like it's not like you had to ask permission to write these songs you just started to do it yeah. because you saw your friends doing it it's like oh yeah i'll try this yeah out. exactly <laughs> yeah yeah um so then you know as, as things started to um you know get more serious with uh, you know propaganda and like you know touring and you know the fact that it's like oh like we're you know we get paid money and you, you could even you know argue well not argue you can even point out the fact like clearly you know the weaker dance existed in the music industry as well by putting out records and touring and all that other stuff you know how yeah. the, the business of the bands that you've been in uh, has that been something that you've had to um I, I know you kind of alluded to it earlier where you're like you're always continually grappling with that but like did you enjoy the business aspect or was that just something you're like god i wish i could ignore it completely and just play music yeah yeah yeah, I can't say I enjoy it that much. I mean, I'm interested in it in a kind of theoretical way. I'm interested in in bands and and musicians who try and do things slightly even slightly differently is exciting to me. You know, like um so yeah, and I like the ethos of of uh of kind of Democracy, which has been in all the bands that I've I've been lucky enough to be in, you know. Um, so I liked, yeah. I remember the early propaganda days were, were when um, there was this zine called "Book Your Own Fucking Life." Oh yeah. That that had uh, you're probably familiar with, you know. It had like. Uh, people's addresses and phone numbers for shows all over North America. And, um, yeah, those tours were, were kind of incredible and, and frightening and, and weird and fun. Um, and then, yeah, when it got kind of more established, uh, yeah, it was, it was fine. Um, yeah. 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 I it's it's not it's not really something that yeah, I I kind of uh a, about a year or two into the weaker lands I I kind of let go of all of that and Steven our guitar player took over and did most of that. Um and in a lot of ways I felt like a failure because I just couldn't I couldn't keep my mind on it. It just wasn't something that I was that interested in and it didn't it didn't move me at all the the industry side of it so yeah. um yeah. so i thought sort of wandered off um but i mean we did set kind of like i think progressive work practices where we could you know like we try and pay everyone exactly the same um and and you know it's so there's some kind of um you know I, we were like i i think of us as like uh, you know, socialists in, and, and we wanted to kind of be, be that in practice. So, and that's always been something that, that I've recognized as great. And, and yeah, and the labels I've worked with have all been based on relationship, not really based on career. Right. You know? Yeah. So like, yeah, I think it's, it's a pretty huge fluke that I'm, on Epitaph Records and I'm really grateful to be you know like it's a total like I don't know how I, how that came about but I'm really glad that it did and right. I just really like them all they're really like they they work really hard on my behalf and and I'm and yeah 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 well so, I, I think it, I, no, <laughs> as I, you know I certainly I don't think I like I've been in the kind of unique position of I've never really looked for a label it's sort of it's just sort been there. Just right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I, I think, I, I think to your point, I think that's, you know, how, you know, good partnerships exist creatively where it's like, you know, mm. if, if a person, 
is interested in the business aspect of the band while also obviously wanting to be creative musically. It's like that yeah. they all serve the same purpose and like they'll be able to, yeah. you know, like it, it'd be a different story if they're, you know, you played with a person who is like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to, you know, to get signed to Capitol Records and like let's put out, you right, know, right. Let, let's be as big as the Foo Fighters or something. Then that would be in stark yeah. contrast to what your goal is. But, you know, if it's totally simple and you're on the same page, you're just like, oh yeah, you handle that. I don't want to, do, I don't want to touch that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I like that that's kind of more and more, well, and, and the democratization of the means of production that, the internet has afforded us all is like there's some pretty cool things about that like there's like you know people can put out their own records and you know like um and that's wonderful and make their own records like when when i started it was still like raising money to go to into a recording studio like that's you know and it was a lot of money so you know like that's that's kind of a yeah we're in a new world like you know, like probably my favorite record of the last while is is Frank Ocean's Blonde, and that's an independent record. Like it's kind of amazing when you think about it. Like it's you know like he put that record out himself. There's no you know I don't know. There's something like when I when I think about that, I'm like wow, that's yeah. You're like incredible. this right? This yeah. This this can happen on a on a whole much larger level. On a yeah. Scale. Yeah. 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 For, no. Totally. Yeah, totally. Beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. Yeah. Um, you know, something that I, I've noticed throughout, the, you know, people asking you questions over the past, you know, fifteen years, is you know, oh. everyone always comes to that fork in the road where they're just like, I can't even. I, it must have been so weird that you left Propagandi, like you left this successful <laughs> band. You know, I'm putting on a, a cheesy reporter voice or whatever, <laughs> but um, you know, like the, the way that I like you know, viewed it. And I think most people probably mm-hmm. viewed it where it's just like, you know, whatever you're in your early twenties and you're just like, Oh yeah. yeah like I want to explore this thing. And like, it's not like some, you know, really like calculated decision to be like, it was a decision based on the fact that you were like, yeah, I want to leave the band because I want to do this other stuff as opposed to like mm-hmm. this huge thing that, you know, that, like that, I don't know. That it just seems very yeah. funny that people project that on you. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. Yeah, I. Um, I mean, they got tons better after I left, right? Like they're, I think, you know, with Todd and uh, and the extra guitar players um, who are both incredible and and yeah, no, I, I I think it was it ended up being best for them and and best for me. I don't. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't even think of it that much. Yeah, really, I can't. It, yeah. I can't really remember. <laughs> you know, it's weird. Like it's sort of dim. Like I, I'm not. Um, yeah, sometimes you just have to recognize that things worked out. You know, like it, and not worry too much about why they worked out. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. I, I just. Yeah. It, it's just. So, it's just so funny because it, it seems like. Is such a uh, decision that it's like most people are confronted with that where it's just like you know even if it's right. like hey do you want to still play in a band or like do you want to like you know get a degree and some people are just like oh yeah I yeah, guess yeah. I guess I gotta get a degree it's the same thing where it's just like do you want to play in this or do you, sure. like, you want to do this you're like well I, I kind of want to do this it's like oh okay <laughs> yeah those like those kind of massive decisions in your life that seem massive at the time or you know often when you look back they're just sort of they're not even choices right. so it's just yeah, they're just there. They're just it's just going to happen. Things that happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah no. um. Explore new cultures and experiences with Intrepid Travel. Intrepid specializes in socially conscious travel with over 900 amazing small group adventures to choose from in more than 100 countries. Whether it's the mountaintop vistas of the Andes, the wildlife of Tanzania, or the hidden noodle bars of Vietnam, Intrepid is there. There to get you off the beaten track, behind the scenes, and totally immersed in the joy of travel. Discover more at IntrepidTravel.com. Intrepid Travel. Travel is back for good. 
On game night, there's only one food delivery service that's a slam dunk. A home run. A hole in one. A touchdown. <clears throat> uh, sorry, I got a bit carried away there. It's Grubhub. For game night eats, late night treats, and sweet and salty faves you crave, lazy lunches, delicious family dinners, and more, it's all about the Grubhub. We all have days when cooking just isn't in the cards. Grubhub is there when you need it most, offering up everything you want from national favorites to the best kept secret spots in town, ensuring that there's truly something for everyone. Right now, Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free, so you pay $0 in food delivery fees when you order from your favorite restaurants. Visit goforgrubhub.com slash Amazon for details. And of course, with the holidays right around the corner, Grubhub gift cards are the perfect gift for everyone on your list. Who doesn't love the gift of food? Order online at grubhub.com or download the Grubhub app from your app store. Place your order and streamline your order and future food deliveries. That's grubhub.com or the Grubhub app. Go for Grubhub. Hey, it's Ray, the host of this very podcast. And let me ask you a question. What if you had insights into your genetics that could help empower you to live healthier? How would you use that knowledge? You can hear me talk about insights from my DNA that have affected my personal health journey on this season of the podcast Spit from iHeartRadio and 23andMe. Host Baratunde Thurston, which by the way, incredible dude, has a podcast called How to Citizen. I can't highly recommend that any more than I am right now, but listen to that and listen to this podcast. But he explores how more and more people are finding out that DNA is about more than just ancestry. It's a key to understanding your health. Your genetic profile can tell you if you are at an increased likelihood for developing a particular condition. It's knowledge that can help you make smarter choices about your health and your lifestyle. On this season of Spit, you'll hear me and 22 other podcasters and influencers discuss what genetics revealed about our health and how that knowledge can impact the way we live our lives. Listen to my episode out now on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. The, um, you know, and, and then, you know, kind of focusing on your, on your time in, uh, you know, the weaker dance where, um, you know, cause like you said, sort of, you know, uh, skewing much of the, uh, conventions of the fact that you are successful and people recognize the band and you can play shows and all that sort of stuff that, you know, you probably right. at the beginning are just like, wow, I can't even believe this is happening. Um, but you know, you've the, the band arguably reached uh, you know some pretty uh, high highs as far as like you know shows you were playing and you know the the interest that the band uh, garnished. Um, I guess kind of you know, and this this is kind of putting you on the spot, but I think you probably have mm. you know some some tangible moments of like as you were starting to you know kind of get out there and put out records and do all that stuff. You know, when did I guess things feel like oh my gosh, like I I this is weird. I can't believe I'm here doing this. Whether it's like a you know it doesn't have to be a specific. Mm. Show show or anything like that but just that feeling of like wow when we put out left and leaving i can't believe this happened or whatever you know Hmm. i don't know if i ever felt that way yeah i think it was it was sort of a gradual a gradual thing and um yeah my my anxiety with with crowds and a lot of things was such where I, i don't feel like i ever really uh, enjoyed that that much, <laughs> you know. Sure. I didn't I didn't get a lot of joy out of it in a weird way. Like it's it sounds like harsh to say, but it didn't. I never had those those moments where you're like, oh, this I'm doing what I want to do in the world. I still don't. I'm still not sure what I want to do in the world. But I, you know, I, I feel like yeah. Um, I was I, I'm obviously super lucky, um, but. Yeah, there there was um yeah, I, I, I can't I can't really pinpoint a moment. I know I know when I felt bad. <laughs> um, you know, was when, uh, yeah, I guess we yeah, when um, on the flip side, yeah, yeah. Like, when did it feel I guess sure. too overwhelming for you? Yeah, and maybe that's lame of me to kind of like No, it's okay. That's the truth. Point out the negative, but, uh, but yeah, it's it's kind of the truth. Yeah, was was when it sort of I feel like there's a certain point with me that if if the audience is too big, like the the fuses blow in a way. Like so, it's like I just I just shut down, and it's like it's not something. It's a job. It's something that that I I don't enjoy anymore. So it's there's this weird point where I'm like, oh, this is. Um, 
having said that, like when I'm actually doing it, when I'm actually playing the songs in front of people, I did love it. But it was like every other moment around that, you know, <laughs> like, right. like every second around that, like that, that, um, that sometimes felt kind of terrible. So, um, so yeah, I learned to love playing, but I also just had a lot of trouble with, with, um, with, with other stuff. So, yeah. so that, that it was, it was, it was, you know, difficult and, and, kind of untenable after a while so right yeah well i i think to that same notion or that that idea that like even you know when you are experiencing these things that you know most people look at as being like wow it's amazing you can play in front of you know 1500 people and like have everybody mm. you know like you know eating from the palm of your hand because of the way you're right. crafted your lyrics or whatever you know um yeah, yeah. like that like you know to your point that <laughs> clouds the vision because it's like you're just focused on that you know whatever 45 minutes to an hour and a half stage time and then like yeah. the moment that you leave it it's like oh here's where all the here's where all the stuff i don't like comes into play exactly yeah yeah for sure and and yeah like i yeah i feel like i i love focusing on i love the feeling of a room where it's like 200 people and um and there's kind of uh an interaction even if it's not kind of verbal you can kind of it feels like a collaboration in a way, like it's the audience and the musicians are doing something together to make something ephemeral that is just for that moment. And that to me is really beautiful. Um, and I just can't, I can't summon it or it doesn't work for me a lot of the time when it's, when it's anything larger than that. Does mm -hmm. that sound I don't know. Yeah. No, so yeah, it, it, it makes kinda, sense. And it's really, it's just specific to it's right. just me. Like yeah. it's not, I'm, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong or it's just, you know, I've learned through my cognitive behavioral therapy that, uh, that <laughs> you can't, uh, you, you know, you can't, you can't pretend to feel something you don't feel. No. Uh, and vice versa. Right. So, right. And like, yeah. there's only so long that you can stuff that feeling away before it yeah. starts yeah, to yeah. manifest itself in different ways. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the sort of, you yeah. know, quiet, easygoing guy, John is like snapping at people and they're like, what the hell is happening? <laughs> it's like, what? what, what, this is a weird vibe. He's never done this before. Yeah. 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 yeah for sure. <laughs> um, and so, you know, something else that, you know, I saw sort of traditionally speaking in regards to mm. the way that people have approached, you know, speaking to you and interview wise and stuff is that, you know, I mean, most people are always like, oh, John, John Sampson, like, you know, just doesn't like to do press. So like, you know, it, it, again, I'm using a hyperbolic voice here, mm -hmm. <laughs> but like, no, you know, yeah. yeah, doesn't like to do press. So like, you know, it goes through these things where it's just like, oh, yeah, you can interview me by postcard or like, you know, you can, um, yeah. you know, yeah. you can't reach out to me on social media. So like, you know, you can't email me or whatever um but the you know i i've always viewed it where it's like there are there are certain people that are willing to put themselves out there and doing that on a regular basis and there right. are people who are like well i'm willing to do that for people who actually have a vested interest in the thing rather than like here's yeah. you know my name on the list of 30 things they got to do today um yeah it, 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 is that kind of accurate? The that that sort of description, rather than like, oh, John's just a you know an asshole. I just want to do press or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> well, part of it is I'm an asshole. But okay, fair enough. Fair kinda, enough. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I think probably a little bit. But you know, uh, yeah. I um, it sounds dumb, but like sometimes I'm just like you know like. I think Neil Young said it, or someone like that. Like when people were interviewing about about his songs, he was like, "Well, the songs are the songs." Like it's right there. Like that's what I that's what I want to put out into the world. There they are. Like you know, that's 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 my job. Uh, and I feel like that as a cultural worker. Like I make I make songs, and if you know that. It's not my job to talk about those songs. I don't feel like I, I feel like you know the songs are supposed to supposed to do something in the world. Um, but I also I can also totally understand why that's that's not uh, exactly right. 
and I'll, and again, it's totally specific to me. Like mm-hmm. I don't feel like I should say, you know, everyone should be, um, you know, leave social media and <laughs> and and never do interviews and and all that stuff. But um, um, I do also feel like I've taken up sort of I've you know I've taken up some space in in the culture. It's a it's you know not a huge space, but. Um, but there's there's other people to speak to uh, that I think uh, are more interesting and more timely, frankly. So so that's that's also something that I've thought about. I remember in the early days of the Weaker Lens, we always said that when we quit, we would invite other bands to quit with us <laughs> to break up with us. So we would do like a mass breakup. Sure. So it would be, <laughs> I love that. So it would be like you know, like a hundred bands break up on one day, and uh, and and you know, loosen up the soil for for some new bands. You know, like I feel like, um, yeah, there's a lot of great, uh, great work out there. So I'm, I'm also like, hey, like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think it, it's something that I, I've, you know, reflected on myself, uh, like not only, you know, interviewing people, but to be in the subject of interviews and like just kind of seeing how that mm-hmm. that sort of like give and take relationship happens where it's like, I think like um, I remember I approached uh, Sam McFeeters, the singer of Born Against. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah who's sure. like, you know, is a notorious curmudgeon like that dude is, you mm-hmm. know, like mm-hmm. tried and true. <laughs> and so I was like, OK, mm-hmm. I, I I'm, I'm scared, but I'm going to try to approach him. So like, you know, you had to write a letter to his P.O. box here in Southern California and like you know I was like okay he's never going to respond to me but like you know he emailed me back and was like yeah I'd I'd love to talk and I think and I think it's one of those things where uh, not not too dissimilar to you know how we're speaking where it's just like when you actually show the person that you actually have a vested interest in their art and are interested in them as a human most people will be like oh yeah like that's fine so like I get right I get that. Where it's more like a, it's a conversation, it's not a transaction, right? Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. That's my, my problem with social media is that it feels so transactional to me, it's so capitalist in its nature, this idea of quantifying everything with, with you know, numbers, basically, of, of, of grading things. So it, to me, I'm like, yeah, like, you can't, conversation, like real conversation and communication doesn't, that's... That's not how it works, right? So I, I agree. Like, I'm totally interested. I love talking to people. But, I, you know, I don't, I don't always think that it's useful for me to do it when I have to talk about myself all the time or, or like... I don't know. Yeah. 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 I know. I, I understand that because it, it's, it, especially too, it's like once you, you know, once you've existed okay. for, you know, whatever, let's say over whatever. 10 years in a particular music scene, um, there's, <laughs> you've discussed a lot of stuff already. You know, most people know the broad strokes of, of who people are. Like, you know, if someone's coming into you and it's like, oh, so where are you from? It's like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, you, <laughs> what, you, you, you don't know that I'm from Winnipeg? Like, this is ridiculous. Mm. Um, mm. But like, but that, that, that idea of just like, yeah, you, you want to be, like you said, it's not this, this transactional thing. It's like this thing will hopefully create value and, you know, maybe be inspirational to a person being like, oh, like now I know that artist a little bit more. And in turn, Mm -hmm. it will challenge me to, you know, make my own art or like be more committed to the band or whatever, you know, whatever the function is. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, imparting imparting the fact that 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 ethos that I think I I kind of emerged as a writer with is that if you if you want to write you can you know <laughs> and and you should yeah absolutely yeah, and kind of and having yeah so that's kind of. Right. That's what. Yeah. You, you you want to put out there where it's just like yeah. You know. I, I'm I, I'm some dumb dumb from the middle of Canada writing some stuff. It's like you could do that too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. No. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The uh, you know I I think the you know th- this is something I've noticed in myself. Like I'm 38 years old, and mm. the the older I get. It, 
I think, and I've noticed this across, you know, other peers and friends and uh, people get really attached to the idea of, of communities. I mean, communities are an important part of any culture, but like, I think people that get exposed to subcultures that becomes even more important as you get older, just because, you know, you have to be more deliberate with your time due to, you know, familial obligations, professional work, whatever. Um, but, but it seems like you, I mean, you've expressed that pretty continually for, you know, a while. I mean, 10 plus years, you've always been really uh, focused on that sort of communal aspect, not only in your shows, but, you know, the, the activities that you do, you know, from the, you know, the writing that you do to, you know, working, uh, you know, with the, uh, the local library and all that sort of stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. like, again, this is, I mean, this is kind of a simple question, but like, you know, when did that kind of interest start or was that something that you had always kind of like, as you started to, you know, go to punk and hardcore shows where you realized that was a community, has that always kind of been part of your purview? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, I do think that it's increased in its importance in my life as I've gotten older, for sure. And and I have I have community here that I'm I'm enormously grateful for. And it's not really music community, though I'm in a couple choirs. So those that's it's a different kind of community uh, than than punk scene, you know. Um, but but yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I think I was always looking for it, and I didn't always find it. Um, and and I think the trap of being from a small town or being from this small town is that you know, that that kind of feeling that life is elsewhere, that that everything is happening somewhere else, right? And that's that's I think a huge um, kind of problem that people now wrestle with as 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 uh as avatars on the internet is this fear of missing out right this kind of like life is always somewhere else so i guess i've yeah i've discovered it in my own community in my own city and that's that's been really helpful for me and it and it's always um it's always uh it's it's there, right? It's it's there, right? And, and it's available, and and a lot of it has to do with sitting in circles with people. Like I'm, I'm, I help run a book club at at the prison here in Winnipeg, and you sit in a circle. And I'm a member of the Quaker community here in Winnipeg, and you sit in a circle. <laughs> and and you know I've been in group therapy, and you sit in a circle. I'm I'm interested in that. That's kind of and you know choir. You, sit with people so you sit with people who you don't uh you wouldn't otherwise sit with right and and that's uh that's the kind of community that i'm i'm most interested in now no i really think that's uh you distilled that very appropriately because i think that the especially with the notion that you always feel like things are happening outside of what you what is immediately visible to you you know it's like mm-hmm. oh yeah that's that you know city over or like that oh because i'm not on tour i'm not feeling like yeah. i'm doing anything or whatever but like there's right. you, like you said there's so much that is easily touchable you know within a five minute yeah. radius of your house and you just need to put yourself there in order to feel it and that's also what was i think one of the dangers for me of being a touring musician was this like this fantasy world i mean it wasn't great or anything but like this this un, the unrealness of the world where where you you know this you go on tour and then you come home and you're like like well you know i have to do things for myself <laughs> you know i have to like yeah. i have to you know i have to it's it's this weird and you're and for me i was always like i think my entire 20s i was thinking well i don't really have to have to commit to anything here because i'll be going on tour again in 6 weeks right so um that was i think very dangerous for me and very kind of unhelpful so so yeah recognizing that it was here all along, you know, uh, is, is, um, 
I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. And I think too, something that I, that I think is valuable to people who have come up in the subculture that we have. Once you interact with people who, you know, frankly have no clue or just don't care yeah. about, you know, whatever punk hardcore, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> but they see the, uh, I guess the, you know, uh, immovable, um, passion that we have towards it. they, you know, become a little interested in like, Oh, like it's not like they'll ever like the music per se, but they'll, you know, understand that sort of like DIY notion of like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, why did you start a band? Uh, just because I did, I picked up the bass and that's what I did. And you're just like, Oh, I guess yeah. you can do that. And you can start to give people that notion that they can pick up and do whatever it is that they want without asking permission. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's a, and it's a beautiful thing that, you know, sometimes people like, you know, not everybody has the, you know, the lucky experience that we have of, you know, tripping across, you know, records and all of a sudden being immersed in this world that is like, oh, yeah, absolutely. You're hanging out with adults yeah. and it's like, what? This is why are you you're 16 years old. Why are you hanging out with a 24 year old? It's like, well, they're just the same. <laughs> yeah. They're at the same show. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it's true. Um, two last things I want to hit on before I let you go. Um, mm. was the, uh, you know, the fact that, um, you, uh, you know, you, you were able to kind of, you know, confront your, you know, your shortcomings as far as your mental illness was concerned and the fact that you wanted to, you know, get help and disconnect from the fact like, Hey, I can't be touring, you know, 250 days out of the year. And I can't, uh, mm-hmm. I can't exist in this, this, this rat race that sometimes people feel like they, they get on. Um, once you kind of, I guess, shifted your focus away from that, um, you know, did you, uh, did you feel that sense of people being like, oh, great, like, now we're not going to get more music from this guy. And, like, you know, that feeling of kind of, I, I don't, I don't want to say, like, arrogance in a way, but just like, oh, dude, like, come on, you've got, you're, you're living the dream, bro. Like, why can't you get your shit together right. or whatever? Um, you know, <laughs> did, you, did you kind of, um, no, I mean, not, like, see that per se, because no yeah. one, I, I guess, is going to come up to you and say that, but, no. you know. Well, and, uh, my output has always been so slow. Like, you know, I've only written, like, less than a hundred songs or no probably a little more but like you know i've been writing since i'm 16 and i'm 45 now i write like three songs a year and and that's like a good year so i've never felt like i've always felt like people who like my music kind of understand that and accept that um that it's you know it's not it's not the center of my life I don't think it should be like I feel like it's the product it's the product of the life I live instead of the other way around so I feel like yeah I've never really felt like that that overwhelming pressure um like you probably know the feeling like it's like every time I write a song I think oh I'll never be able to do that again or like <laughs> right. every time I think every time I think I'm gonna like I think about writing a song I'm like I, I don't even know how that how you do that. Like, like I have um, I have uh, I'm looking at my bookshelf right now, and I have songwriting for dummies on the bottom shelf of one of my that I actually went out and bought one time. I was like, you know, like how, how do you do this? So you know, I feel like yeah, that's never been never been. Um, I've never felt a lot of pressure in that way. That's actually that's that's good. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love. I just I love that visual of you going into a you know a bookstore and being like, "Hey, hey, hey guys, I, I've written like 150 songs, but I just ran into a wall. I can't I can't write anymore. Do you got a book for that? <laughs> yeah, here, try this out, John. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of helpful, actually. It's not a bad book. I've, re- I've read I've read a couple of them, and they're kind of like there's some good ones. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, and you know, like some of my favorite things I've done as as work has been to run. Uh, songwriting workshops where you're like where you hear what other people do and you and you kind of craft songs in a again in a circle i think that it's really powerful um to like share share your work with others and you and in that delicate kind of frightening process of making something being open to that experience is, has been really helpful for me too yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's really cool. I, I I just love the the uh, repeated pattern of like you know doing things in a circle because yeah, it's like when you yeah. it's so true. Like you boil it down to simplest of terms, and it's like people getting in a circle talking about stuff. Like that is sometimes some of the coolest things that can happen to you in your life where you're 
unlocking some you know part of your brain because someone said something in a circle yeah definitely yeah, yeah i do feel like that um True. Um, and so yeah, the uh, I, I said two last things, but I'm going to squeeze one more in here. I apologize, but <laughs> the um, you know s- since you've ostensibly you know been able to you know make a living as a uh, you know a musician and artist, um, is is that like something you actually write on your customs form as you're traveling, where it's like you <laughs> you write a musician? Yeah, I guess I do for my visa into the United States because that's what it's based on. Oh, that's true. Um, that's true. <laughs> But uh, otherwise, yeah, I guess that is, you know what, I'm finally, I finally feel kind of comfortable with that. that right. I, I can, I would always write something else, like, you know, until like the last five years where I'm like, eh, I, I put musician or I put writer and, and I'm like, oh, wow, that's kind of, kind of is what I am. Right. Yeah. 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 So, uh, <laughs> You've grown comfortable. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I'm I'm sort of more comfortable with that now. I'm owning owning that now. Yeah, Good. which um, yeah. you know, because m- most people, especially just because as we were discussing earlier, you know, your uh, you know business acumen is not something that you are uh, you yeah. know, <laughs> is not something you are you are you are proud of. Um, no, it's very poor. Yeah, but, but the um, you know the fact that you've been able to to do it is um, you know hmm. pretty cool because obviously most people like especially again in the subculture we exist in everyone like looks at you know fugazi as the like untouchable it's like oh dude if every bank could be like fugazi and charge five dollars at the door yeah. and not sell merch and it's like yeah um right right you know ideally that would be rad but not everybody can i uh, know yeah it's true right <laughs> yeah um yeah i know and it's a total fluke but like you know when people ask me advice on industry stuff it's like i i have no idea like i have no idea how like the, the series of events that led me to here are are you know pretty much based on chance so it's kind of I can't really tell anyone how how to do it so yeah it's it's because uh, I know I know so many amazing songwriters and musicians who can't make a living you know like some of my all-time favorites cannot make a living just doing music so uh you know that has to do with the injustices of capitalism so it's like it's a much bigger thing than than trying to navigate through the music industry so um yeah it's a it's a weird uh it's a weird world yeah no totally there's the yeah there's there's really no um yeah, there's 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 no blueprint that people can look at. Like, no matter what road no. you've taken, it's like no. You're like I could I could tell you the 400 mistakes I did that could lead me to here, but that's the right, best exactly. I could. That's the best I could do. Yeah, <laughs> and I like that idea of like I feel like real. I feel real solidarity with with other musicians, and and I like that now. Like I feel like yeah, that we're workers, right? And and that we have to think of ourselves as workers and and um look out for each other as workers so yeah for sure yeah. um mm. this is a uh, you know i think that sometimes that's that's not a thing in the cult like yeah like you're right you know artists are this kind of separate thing who do this mysterious work and that's not so like we're it's 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 labor and it should be respected as labor so yeah yeah oh for sure i mean it's it it's it's a craft in the same way that you know like uh you know hammering a steel anvil i mean hammering a steel anvil takes you know arguably more skill than writing a song but yeah. you know writing a song is also pretty yeah. difficult too well yeah and i don't want to compare my no <laughs> my my work to to uh someone who actually actually works hard <laughs> yeah, who, yeah who, who does but, a, who does something uh, useful yeah. and not just writing crap crap yeah. crappy acoustic <laughs> songs out there <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, the the last thing is that you know you because you've existed in a you know very you know left wing socialist political world and that's been your political beliefs ever since you have been able to express that in all the bands that you've played in. Um, but you know by nature you being a more you know quiet and reserved person, um, there you know a lot of times people see those political beliefs and are just like. Oh yeah, like this dude is going to be in my face about all this stuff, and is like going to you know yell at me and everything like that. Um, you know, but clearly, 
Like I, I don't, I don't see you, uh, I guess kind of doing that. So like, I'm sure there's been many times or many, not many times, but there's been times you've been confronted about your beliefs because of people, you know, reading one thing or seeing one thing and being like, Oh, well, I like your music, but I, you know, I hate you as a person because of what you believe or, yeah. or you know, how have you kind of navigated that, you know, people throwing stones at you from that, uh, I guess the political perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been, yeah, it's interesting sometimes, like, um, uh, I do get some of that, like, people, people write me kind of angry, angry, um, letters, or they, they come up to me after a show and, and, and tell me that they don't, you know, agree with something I said on stage, which is not that common, I don't talk much on stage, but, um, yeah, it's a it's um I do feel like one of the great one of the things I really like about the time we live in right now, there's not many things, but uh one of the good things I think is that um people's politics are are have been forced to the surface, I think of 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 their lives. Um where there there's no um there's no getting away from it. Um so uh and I feel like it's now sort of a really accepted thing that an artist um, who who kind of doesn't make overtly political art will still be political, will still have a politics, right? So I feel really kind of comfortable in that in that um, you know being a writer who's who's um, not always overt about about my. Um, about my beliefs, but but um, I do. Again, I feel like there's a template there that 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 is sort of traced onto everything that I write. That the, the politics are there somewhere, but sometimes they're they're sort of tucked away. Mm-hmm. But I do feel like na- nowadays that's um, that's kind of common, and and um, yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah, <laughs> no, for sure, because I, I think it's a. Uh... Especially when you're talking about stylistically, uh, the music that you've, you know, created for a while, like people don't automatically assume that there's going to be a political undertone in, you know, the, the, the quiet, uh, you know, acoustic indie rock or whatever. It's like most people, you yeah. know, view that as like, oh yeah, you're going to be an aggressive rock band. So of course you're going to say something negative about, you know, capitalism <laughs> or politics or whatever. Um, right. And so, yeah. But that's, it, and it's also just about like, you know, what people are able to write. Like, I'm just not able to write as directly as maybe I'd like sometimes. Um, you know, that's, that's not, yeah, it, it, it requires a, you know, it requires a tapestry. It requires like all different kinds of, of art yeah. to move and change the world, you know? Yeah. And, and approaches too. It's like, you know, there are, yeah. you know, yeah. if you're looking at weapons, like of course there's a blunt hammer and then there's a sniper rifle yeah. and you know, all the things that, right, right. that people unfortunately use against one another. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Poor, sure. Poor, poor metaphor for this conversation, but <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the uh, the last thing I want to hit on was the you know the fact that uh, you know you you've clearly uh, a lot of people you know really attach themselves to uh, your lyrics and the way that you uh, you know describe uh, you know the scenarios that you lay out in the songs and everything like that and you know like you mentioned before you you know fancy yourself a writer and you've <laughs> you've crafted your, uh, your 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 art towards that as well um, and I I know people have been like oh so like when are you going to put out a book like when are you going to do you know uh, a collection of short stories and that sort of stuff. Um, I presume that right. your your response is still just like that. I, I don't have the attention span for that, or I don't have the. Um, no, I don't. Yeah, no, I love books. Like that's what I've always wanted to be as a as a book writer. Um, but I do not. I am not able to do. That. I recognize now. I'm 45. It's. it's I I can write like 500 words, and that's you know, 500 to a thousand words is like anything more than that. I just. And I'm fine with that. Like I found, I found a form that um, that I can work with. Uh, I think songwriting is super democratic and and um, available, and and uh, and and I love it. So I no, I feel like um, songwriting is sort of 
where all of that goes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but also, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I would challenge you, John, because I think that, mm. uh, you, um, you know, you are, are very, uh, you know, self, uh, well, I wouldn't say self, well, I was going to say self defecating, but that's not even a word. Uh, you, you, <laughs> you, you, you tend to, uh, you know, maybe sell yourself a little bit uh, short in certain respects of your life. So, you know, mm. I think you, you might be able to, you know, pull something together, whether it's, uh, you know, just some, <laughs> some music. Things, uh, some some things that you could probably be like using, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah a little little uh, little zine, you know. You could probably do something like that. <laughs> well, I mean, zine culture is like where I like, you know, yeah. That was the kind of that's another thing that I really loved about the punk scene was was kind of zines. I loved that. That was and and I still do. Like I still make little little pamphlets for you know for my friends and family. I. Uh, they come on my printer here and and in my community and it's it's fun yeah no i i totally see that but i i feel like uh, uh i think what i present to the world is is songs yeah sure yeah, yeah you're like a, you're like i know uh, i know my vehicle and i'm going to stay in it <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah for sure yeah well, uh, John, I really honestly appreciate you hanging out with me because I know this is, uh, like I said, not something you, uh, you, you typically do. But, uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Oh, I super enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your persistence and, uh, and your, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. your excellent, uh, excellent conversation. Yeah. Yes, that was Mr. Samson. Thank you very much. It was funny because at the very, like before we started recording, I could tell he was kind of uh, nervous, you know, and like, cause he just doesn't do this sort of stuff often. Like I don't, I didn't ask him, but I don't get the impression that he's done like a ton of podcasts, partially too, because I was doing a ton of deep dive research on him and there isn't a ton of stuff around about him from that perspective. So anyways, an eternal, eternal thank you for John for coming on this show and uh, trusting me with, uh, you know, making sure that <laughs> we had a, a enjoyable conversation. So thank you very much for that. An eternal thank you to Wiretap Records as well. Use their code 100 words for $15 off whatever they got in their store. So wiretaprecords.com, please check it out. And also rockabilia.com. That is PC Jabberjaw for 10% off of your order. Please do that and you will be clothed in band merch. And what do we have next week in a, in, in my favorite way to transition from a, uh, you know, sort of folk singer songwriter, uh, you know, r- indie rockish guy. How about we talk to Manny Mustafi or money Mustafi? I think that's, that's how you actually say it, uh, from race trader. How about that? Right. Weaker than's race trader, race trader. Love it. Love the transition between the two. Anyways, that's what we got next week. I love you. I hope you were doing okay. It will get better. I promise you. Okay. Until then, please be safe, everybody. You've been listening to the Jabberjaw Podcast Network. Jabberjawmedia.com. Explore new cultures and experiences with Intrepid Travel. Intrepid specializes in socially conscious travel with over 900 amazing small group adventures to choose from in more than 100 countries. Whether it's the mountaintop vistas of the Andes, the wildlife of Tanzania, or the hidden noodle bars of Vietnam, Intrepid is there. There to get you off the beaten track, behind the scenes, and totally immersed in the joy of travel. Discover more at IntrepidTravel.com. Intrepid Travel. Travel is back for good. Happy Holidays, my podcast on iHeart has brought me together with friends both old and new. Want to know how fashion designer Michael Kors built his iconic American brand? Aren't you curious how rapper Snoop Dogg and I really became good friends? Catch up on the Martha Stewart podcast this holiday season on the iHeart Radio app or wherever you get your podcasts. People who don't know Bruce have to understand two things. One is he's built like something Michelangelo has carved out of a piece of marble. True. This is true. And number two, he's the first person to show you that at every party, at every dinner. Maybe off. take it, take a shirt off. I'm Bruce Bozzi. That was George and Julia. You may not know me yet, but you already know most of my lunch dates by their first names and voices alone. Listen to Table for Two on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.